Now this is Abraham speaking. Beloved God, please tell me, what do you mean by the promised land? Abraham, the promised land is a reflection of your consciousness. When you are fully present and awake in the truth of life, the promised land will be revealed. And when it is revealed, you will know it as heaven on earth. For heaven revealed on earth is the promised land. But God, where is the promised land? It is right here, Abraham. It has always been here. It will always be here. Wherever you are, Abraham, it is always here. But I cannot see it. You cannot see it because you are not here yet, Abraham. I don't understand, God. If I am not here, then... Where am I? Abraham, you are not here because you are lost in your mind. The world of the human thinking mind is an illusion. It is the only place where I do not exist, Abraham, for I am not an illusion. Then where are you, God? How can I find you? I am always here, Abraham. I am in these flowers. I am in these tables. I am in this room. I am the silent presence at the very heart of all things present. I am the present moment revealing itself to you right now. If you want to find me, you will have to come to where I am. You will have to bring yourself fully present, for I exist only in the present moment. But God, my thoughts never stop. I am always in the past and future. I don't know how to free myself from the mind. Be patient, Abraham. It will be revealed. If not to you, then to those who will follow you. I will send a messenger of the way. How will I know when I'm in the promised land? How will I recognize it? Your mind will be silent, Abraham. The past and future will dissolve. You will feel the deepest level of peace. It will feel like coming home. Everything you see will be a light with my presence. And you will feel a kind of oneness with all that is. Trust me, Abraham. When you awaken unto the promised land, you will know. May I ask you one more question, God? Of course you may, Abraham. What is right relationship with you, God? To be present is to be in right relationship with me, Abraham. And as you deepen into presence, you will gradually surrender to my will. You will be motivated not by fear, but by love and a deep recognition of the oneness of all things. Just be present, Abraham, and you will know me, and you will love me. That is all that is needed. Eventually, you will come to such a deep level of silence and presence that the distinction between you and me will dissolve completely. All separation will dissolve, and heaven on earth will be revealed. In that moment, you are no longer Abraham. You are Jacob become Israel. So he... Um gets right into the heart of the matter again, which is that the promised land is right now. It's here. That heaven is right here now, which is a difficult thing for us to, once I understand, I think we understand it intellectually, but we don't feel it necessarily. So for instance, you know, we look around us, we see the COVID-19, uh, all of the 
the racist stuff that's going on. And yet uh, he's saying that this is heaven on earth, but we don't see it because we're not here. And if we want to experience God, if we want to experience this kingdom of heaven, we have to be here. And he's saying that the issue is that we're just not here fully enough to experience it. And to the extent that we are here, we experience the divine. And that we begin, I liked what he said there towards the end, that we begin to experience ourself as the silence and as the presence. This, this is who we are. And that's why, you know, that simple exercise that we did at the beginning, being Christ for one minute or five minutes or however long, is so important because it's retraining ourselves to move out of the mind and to move into this place where we can experience the silence and say, that's me, this presence that ex expresses itself in and as silence is actually who I am. And that that's the promised land. And then he, you know, he said, the, the, there will be a messenger who will show you the way or tell you the way. And uh, it's interesting, the early Christians, you know, were called the followers of the way. And the way was to how to be present, how to be in the moment how to be in the silence. That's the way where we're going to, is the silence and the presence. Very different from, you know, how Christianity has presented us um, a very different journey. Okay, your thoughts. I just finished reading Leonard Jacobson's book. I think it's called The Journey Into Now. And this is one of his predominant messages throughout the book is be here now, be present, and deepen into presence. And so I've been playing with this, trying to understand what experientially, what does that mean? <laughs> and I, I guess that what I've been experiencing is um, more frequently just being aware of being aware and also becoming more aware of how often I am in the mind, either thinking about something from the past or planning something for the future and practicing conversations I might have with somebody or, you know, just live <laughs> in not being anywhere, but, but right here. And, um, that's been an interesting, you know, it's been fun to play with it and to just become more aware of how I, how I move through life and trying to remind myself to come back to now. So like in the morning, if I sit out on the deck um, or the sunroom with my coffee, just trying to sit there without thoughts and listen to the birds and not, I, my mind wants to go to, oh, that's a nuthatch or that's a blue jay or that's a crow. <laughs> And trying not to do that, not to name everything, because that's the mind engaging again. Um, so it's, it's been uh, rewarding because I've just felt a deeper peace than my typical risk making <laughs> mind chatter. Yeah. Um... Something that just popped into my head as you were speaking there was uh, right out of Genesis that um, Adam and Eve in the garden, and then that Adam named all of creation. So instead of just being one with creation, he was busy. He was naming it all. Oh, that's a blue jay. That's a lion. You know, it just struck me that that was a moment of separation for him you know, the need to control it or um, narrate it rather than the pure experience of being um, and of existence. And just like as you're hearing the birds saying, 
Oh, I, I am these words. You know, we, we are the one presence. And then like feeling that as if their bird song is yours or when they fly that you're flying. As you said, rather than, oh, you know, that's such and such. And, you know, I could put out some bird feed for them or whatever. Yeah. Thank you. I've noticed that um, when we meditate together um, on Mondays, you know, uh, Monday afternoons for an hour, and uh, that um, when I first really went as deep as I could, there was like nothing there, you know. Uh, it, I wasn't having any thoughts, and I also wasn't having any, any revelations, you know. It was just like, it was just blank. And, uh, and then I noticed, you know, that that was very pleasant, you know, and that that was very uh, uh, comforting. And as, as it goes on, then uh, I think there are times when then, like uh, 20 minutes or a half hour would pass by without any thought, without just being, you know, and um, that was really helpful to me and uh, to use in my own meditation. And I think the power of the other people also meditating, maybe uh, our group uh, consciousness or the creating a, um, a frequency together, um, has really helped me to be able to go deep early on in a meditation without any thought and not be concerned if I'm not, you know, God's not speaking to me. Uh, there's just, um, it's just a part of the way, you know, part, uh, heading in the right direction and being open and listening and not being concerned. If that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, kind of the image that came to me as you were talking was like of diving into the ocean. And um, it's a whole different world. It's a whole different experience. And it feels more connected or something because, you know, you can see this volume of water and whatever else is going on. But at the same time, it's quieter. It's... Um, altering it alters your own experience of yourself there's maybe a sense of expansiveness when you're under the water and that's kind of what meditation and prayer is for us like he's saying it it takes us deeply into an experience of the present moment that it's like a sponge that filling up with water and now we feel deeper, you know, we feel our own presence and our capacity for consciousness. Um, I was sharing last night that um, in the Catholic Church, there's, there's a thing called um, having a holy hour where they would put, you know, what they call the Blessed Sacrament, the wafer, you know, container and put it on the altar. And then people would just be there in adoration of the divine or just to connect and you'd be as quiet as you could. And so one year I decided, um, being the perfectionist, of course, number one, that I was going to do this every day. And I probably did it 320 out of the 365 days. And um, it was this profound experience. It's like that whole year was so different. Um, and I was like, I, I would often fall asleep. And then when I would come out of it, I would just be like blasted. I would be in this altered state almost. And, and then the day would feel different. Like I would feel so connected and the day would just flow. And then all these wonderful sort of experiences happened that year. Um, And, you know, I also remember when I was down in Menlo Park at the seminary that I started to do it in a different way. It was, I would sit in the sitting room and uh, the, the other term that was used, by the way, 
Okay, sound is wobbling. The, um, the other term that was used in the Catholic Church was the real presence. Like when you were sitting in front of the Blessed Sacrament, that was the real presence. So I started to apply that to what, we, what he's talking about here, that the real presence is when I can be quiet and I can just jump into the present moment as deeply as possible and just be open. What do I experience? And so I started to play with that, like my real presence. It's not about this piece of bread up on the altar and that's Jesus and I'm not. No, it's like, how deeply can I go into the present moment? And I would do that for like 15, 20 minutes every night. And again, I started to have a completely different sense of my own beingness and life. I forgot about that till just now. Anyway. Any any thoughts on what he was saying? I'll chime in. <clears throat> uh, Claire, you, I, I, uh, let me see if I can remember the phrase, uh, practicing a conversation I want to have with someone. <laughs> um, I do that a lot, and I hadn't thought of using the word practice. I think that really, it, it um, uh, brought, it, it made me more aware of how, of, of what's going on, maybe. Uh, I'm going to play with this some more, of, of what's going on when I do that. And as I was listening to it and thinking about myself, I was think I realized, oh, I'm, I'm trying to control the, the, the conversation or what's going to happen, you know, in the future. So I'm not in the present moment and I'm, and I'm not thinking I want to be in the present moment when I have that conversation. And that was a wonderful realization. It's like, oh, and then with all the stuff I've learned from the Enneagram being a nine and part of that whole um, MO is of trying to avoid conflict, right? So I'm trying to think of the way I'm practicing the conversation to have it the way that I want it to go, so I'm in control, and it is when it's a conflict that I'm trying to resolve or talk about, I'm trying to do it in a way that doesn't feel like a conflict, right? And so I'm practicing and thinking that whole thing out. And I and I do, I, I have used the word rehearsal before, but I think practice is working better for me or something. So thanks for that. But is but just realizing that it's not willing to be, I'm thinking about not being present in the future. <laughs> so I'm going to play with that. Thank you. <laughs> that just reminded me of the song that we sing, uh, Practicing the Presence of Illuminated Life. Uh, we come together as one, witnessing the essence of the thing behind all life. So wh what we're doing when we shut ourselves up is witnessing the essence of the thing behind all life. As Matt Kahn would say, it's the space in which the experience is happening. It's the space in which thoughts are arising, feelings are arising. And to stop identifying so much with the thoughts and the feelings and realize that, no, you're the space in which these things are happening. Very different perspective. And then we can trust the flow. Like we don't have to practice the conversation ahead of time, or we don't have to be fearful of you know setting it up and all of that. So it just struck me. That's a huge one, Jerry. You just gave me another illumination on it. So in that, <clears throat> when I get in, when I think about getting into that conversation, um, and when I do get there, I'm not connected with source usually, mm -hmm. right? Because I'm in this fear state of, oh, this is going to be a conflict, or how can I control this or whatever. So the other part of the remedy is to enter that, just reframe that and start entering that conversation with 
being connected mm -hmm. to the one, you know. And I also liked that uh, where he started and where you started was with the connection with nature. That's the one place where I get it, where all this makes sense to me and I don't have to work at it. And I just wish I could um, transfer <laughs> that mm -hmm. state of present momentness to everything else I do. But, but I think the do is the part, you know, I'm doing, well, even when I'm in nature, I'm doing something, you know, I'm watching the birds and I, I did start decades ago, the practice of not naming them, just watching what they were doing and being fascinated. <clears throat> or when I'm out in the garden, there's also, so I mean, a long time ago, I learned that my best meditation is a kinesthetic one, not a sitting one. So it's either swimming or walking or dancing or doing Tai Chi or something, you know. But I think it's the same thing <clears throat> in, the, in the garden. I'm pulling weeds or I'm doing whatever. And I'm not really thinking about what I'm doing. I'm just doing it. it. It's kind of, I'm just, you know, and there's no, the, my mind is quiet. So I don't know what it is about that, but um, it, it, I, I just, ah, I wish I could do that with everything. <laughs> mm. But that, at least I have that one example that works for me that I know what, um, what Leonard's talking about. There, I do have this one way of getting into the present moment and no thoughts in my mind. <clears throat> Thank you. So I'm enjoying all of the comments this morning. And I was just thinking about my grandmother who taught me how to say the rosary and what an actual gift that was for me because I'm highly distractible. So to be able to concentrate and focus is real important for me. And um, luckily the pandemic has been highly useful. Um, I have found that silence is life-giving to me. It's like life support. And I need to be in silence. And, um, but I also would be willing to do anything not to be with me and to be busy planning more fun in the future. So there's a constant, I have to make clear um, choices. So what I've learned to do is spend a lot of time in at Wolf Creek because it is so beautiful. And um, I don't mind walking with other people. I make a practice of doing that and being in community, but I particularly appreciate not having to respond or talk to anybody. And that's really new for me. In our class, A Course of Love, we're having a graduation ceremony um, next week. And the reason is because we have finished being students and teachers. We have dissolved into divine dialogue. And so we're going to be celebrating that and being present and um, listening more closely and trying to be as teachable as we possibly can, but in a different way, in the way of imagination and in the way of direct dialogue, which is pretty something to me. Thanks. Wow, that's, that's great to hear. Um, hmm. So the, the thought that also sort of hit me this morning was, he said, the promised land is a reflection of your consciousness. And I was thinking, you know, we've always thought of the promised land as something that's defined for us, it's a given. But how would you define the promised land for yourself based on your consciousness, if you think about it? And, and I'll give a little example from both Claire and Richard when you said about the birds, because then it dawned on me, like, we were sitting outside last night and we have a hummingbird feeder. And, you know, there's this one brat of a hummingbird who hides out in the tree and then he has two hummingbird feeders that he's monitoring and he dive bombs, you know, three or four other hummingbirds that are trying to feed there. And <laughs> it just struck me. It's like, every time I see that, I'm in this moralizing, you know, why doesn't he share? Why doesn't he, why does he have to be such a 
pain in the butt. You know, there's four other birds that could be there. And that's my consciousness as I'm watching this. And like, oh God, I'm so, so tied into fairness again and morality. <laughs> it's like, so this is my experience of nature instead of just observing, you know, for instance. Anyway, so what's the promised land <laughs> uh, based on your consciousness? You know, how, how, how does it get reflected? Mind obviously is a very um, perfect and fair and moral and everybody behaves and shares equally. Um, actually, I don't think this is what you're asking, but it sort of goes back to when we were talking about entering the present moment. And I was just um, reflecting last night, we were watching a little bit of news and there just was a short segment about the video that they doctored of the two little children. I don't know if everyone saw that or not, but the, all they showed was just the good part of the two little, the little black uh, child and the little white child running from the opposite directions and hugging. And um, so it made me think there are moments that we can use to enter that. Um, how they say behind the, um, the source behind all life, or how did you say that? Uh, witnessing the essence of the thing behind all life. Witnessing the essence, yeah. And that little, just tiny little video just took me there, you know, witnessing that. Um, and I was just thinking about, well, there's all kinds of things like that. And Kathy Lee was talking about the flowers that, or Wolf Creek, or uh, you know, it could be any number of things in nature, right? It could be, um, you know, your partner. Uh, it could be your anything. Um, and to use those things to go, um, to go there, you know, any time to, to get into that present. That would just made me think of that, that that's one way to do it in this uh, kind of chaotic world that's going on right now that's all okay one of the things that i've been doing is doing uh, can can everybody else turn off their microphones right now except for claire we're getting a lot of feedbacks there we go okay so one of the things i've been doing is trying to um identify triggers for me to help me come back into present moment. So for example, washing my hands or washing the dishes, I tried, I, I, I've sort of said, okay, well, every time I wash my hands or every time I do the dishes, I'm going to be very present with the feeling of the water on my hands, feeling the temperature, the sun, and not, not identifying them as such with words, but just experiencing those things. And it, what it does is it works as a remind. That's a reminder to come back into the present. And um, it's amazing how enjoyable it is to wash dishes when you are in the present moment and feeling the warmth of the water and the suds and putting my hand on the clean plate. And I don't know. There's just there's just a joy there that's not there if I'm just trying to rush through getting the dishes done. <laughs> So it's, uh, that's, that's been really um, a successful way for me to come back into the present moment. And when I am in the present moment, life is much better. Um, so it truly is heaven on earth when you are not thinking about possible problems or having anxiety about what might happen or uh, it just can go on and on. But being present with what is happening now is truly a gift. 
So you're talking about the micro experience of the macro, that there's this incredible experience, awareness, consciousness, that we have access to in the present moment. And the more I can just open and use all of my sensory inputs, I get a better, bigger experience of it. And, um, and the way, that's the way, the way in to this experience is to do that. And if your mind is narrating, you're not having the experience, so let me push you a little bit, Claire. So if I was to ask you, based on all of your training and experience and whatever, over all these years of being on a spiritual path, how, how would you describe the promised land? And, and what was, if it's changed, what was the promised land and what is it now? What's different? Part of that question is easier to answer than yeah, another. <laughs> yeah, but for it, all of us. <laughs> yeah. I can speak that in my previous versions of myself, the promised land was when I died. Mm. And so I would, there was a time in my life when I would go to bed and as my head hit the pillow, I'd say to myself, one day closer to Jesus. <laughs> 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 I was living for beyond my death. Was, I mean, it was really, now that I, I, at the time, I was very satisfied with myself for that because I was, um, like, not afraid of death and that death was a good thing and things, and, and I still think that, but it was, I guess, I don't know, enough said on that, but that was my promised land was, was after death. So was it your relationship with Jesus was like being with him was the promised land right and okay. i and i and, and but but it was heaven perceived as where i would go after that's what i would enter at the moment of death was so enter heaven. it was a physical place that you would be with jesus i i didn't think of it as a physical place but i thought of it as you know a place of spirit but very real um so, okay. but I also had a very, very strong and active relationship with Jesus mm -hmm. during that time. Right. Um, I felt like I had dialogues with him and things like that. But, uh, right. but today, what is the promised land for me today? I think what it is, is a mind at peace. It's a, a being present to the people around me. Um, it's really easy for me to get lost in my iPad and Jay's trying to talk to me and I kind of go, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> and I've been really working, I don't know if he's noticed, but I've been working at closing the iPad and looking at him instead of trying to do two things at once. I have been a multitasker for decades and taken great pride in being a multitasker. I got a lot accomplished, a lot done, but now I see that as not such a wise way to live and that you really can only be present as you're doing each thing rather than trying to do three things at once. So for me, the promised land is, is being present in peace and being present for the people around me. Hmm. And I'm still getting there. <laughs> yeah, well, no, it was a beautiful, uh, uh, what would you say, uh, 180 or, uh, you know, it's a very different concept, obviously. And, and as you said that, what, who popped into my mind was Mr. Rogers. I was just thinking of how he would be with children and, you know, the adults would be upset because you know, there's a program, there's a plan, and, and he's like totally in the moment with that child as if nothing else matters and no one else matters. Anybody else want to talk kind of about a segue, else? Yeah. yeah. Kind of a segue on that. Um, um, I have a grandchild. Um, 
mute yourself. Too much feedback. There's, Let me go in the other room. Yeah, there's something happening there with your. Okay, we've got two phones going here. Ah. Uh, um, kind of a segue on the children thing. We have a, a grandson who's a little over a year old. And ever since he was born, he has the most intense stare. And when you look into his eyes, you can't help but be anything but present. Um, he just he just has a very loving, intense look. I'm just like he came into this life um, knowing something. And so when I when I'm with him, even even now, I mean, he just stares at you so lovingly, and um, uh, sounds. Oh, there you are. You're back. Okay, we lost you there for a little bit. Oh, I'm moving around the house to get away from Ken. <laughs> the other phone. You're good. You're you're good. Did you hear what I said? Or I'm not sure about the last piece. We lost you for about twenty or thirty seconds. I'm I'm just saying when you're when I'm with him when I'm with that little grandchild looking into his eyes it's very easy to be present. Yeah. Because he's present, and it's it's just very intense and loving and, and I just really feel in the moment when I'm with him. Right. That's that's a beautiful example of it. And brings back to my mind when I, I would thank you. Um I I had a similar experience with a dog. It was this Native American Indian think, dog. Uh, and I would uh, when I looked at this dog young, and, and it was like, get a little intense at times. Sorry, Greg, can you repeat what you said? <laughs> it, it's showing that your microphone is muted, but I'm hearing you. Get closer to the mic. I, it was garbled. I couldn't make out what you said. Can you hear me? Oh, Jay. Yeah. OK. Is somebody else? Okay. No, no, no. I thought it was Greg. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, when I was, uh, when, when we had young kids, there were times where things just got exhausting. And um, I would go up to our room and I would just sit and start to pray, but then very quickly just end up in silence and then later would fall asleep. And looking back, that was probably my promised land. It was, it was, true peace and I you know I'd come back downstairs and I'd say um, to Clara she'd ask me what I was doing and I said I'm just sitting there you know with kind of a blank mind <laughs> and and she she would say well what were you thinking about I I'd say my mind was blank and it was very peaceful and it was wonderful I and I came to call it my Homer Simpson moment <laughs> <laughs> because Homer Simpson always has the blank bubble when people <laughs> ask him a question. So that you get a little perspective of my personality. Um, but we can, you know, that's, I can go into times where I'll just sit and be still. And uh, that to me is, I, I never recognize it as a promised land, but it was true peace. And, um, you know, I, now that I think about it, it would be the promised land uh, on earth. Yeah. So that's kind of uh, how I would do it. I would just, but I, I started by going up to a quiet room and uh, let it go. Right. Which, of course, is symbolic for the mind, the quiet mind, the room of the mind being quiet. And then the universe floods in. You know the, the expansion of consciousness, the peace, or whatever. And for most of us, that's where we have to start out: is maybe running away from the world and from our um, 
attachment to things or people or whatever. And we have to find this quiet corner to do that in. But then I think eventually we have to come back and, you know, maybe you had this experience, Jay, of maybe when you were with the kids that you sort of had the realization that you were getting worked up or this was annoying or whatever. And then you go, okay, let me, let me try and be blank. Let me, let me not have any thoughts about this or any feelings. So, you know, he said, um, you cannot experience me because you're not here. I'm always here. I'm always in this experience of the present moment. We're the one that's saying, no, God isn't there. And I know this is very challenging, but I'm, I'm going to put it out there so that we get the, the picture, so to speak. Again, it goes back to, can we look at the policeman with his knee on the neck of George Floyd? And can we say, God is still here? And that can I find God in this moment? And, and then, like we were talking about last night, all things are neutral. How, how can I understand that even this moment somehow is neutral? And that my thoughts are not neutral and my emotions are not neutral. But when I am in the place of being connected to the divine, I don't have to necessarily freak out in this situation in the sense of, well, so it's, it becomes a practice. And, and we saw that with Jesus at the crucifixion. You know, it was like he was in a place of still being connected. Any other thoughts on what your promised land is, Richard? So I, b before... I don't think I ever thought of it the way that Leonard was talking about it, of it as it being silence in present moment. And it took me a ways through this session to realize what I had, that so replaced my previous thought, <laughs> you know, and then it finally came up to me, you know, what, when you asked the question, what it, what it was previously was a state of unconditional love. And that's what I thought the promised land was. And uh, and also what Christ consciousness is. So I, my question is now is what is the connection between a state of unconditional love, non-judgmental Christ consciousness and present moment. And so that's what I'm working on. And I'll throw that out, see if anybody has any thoughts on that. Well, it strikes me that ecstasy, which is ex status, you know, you're, you're going out of the moment in the way that you've defined it. <clears throat> and you're opening up to a bigger, better understanding experience of what's happening right here, not right now. And that's where it feels to me like, as I said, the universe floods in the the love of the universe for itself and for every part of itself um, the joy the peace the fulfillment all of all of those things it's like they're they're all right here if we can just find the access point and and the access point is not judging the present moment but being open to what is and letting it flow through. So the, the promised land floods in as love and joy and peace and bliss. You know, even Jadamali continually in her meditations tries to seed the meditation with those type of ideas. And it's like, you know, 
or, or even you hear people say, well, yeah, right now, even with everything being as crazy as it is, you can still experience joy. And there's nothing wrong with experiencing joy because it's somehow, it's inbuilt into this moment. You know, and for some people that feels blasphemous or something. Well, how can I feel joy when people are dying of this horrible disease or racism is rampant? How can, how can I have joy? Because we're diving deeper. All of that stuff is just the, w the wave on top of the ocean and we're going into the depths. And I mean, isn't that why the saints stand out? Because St. Francis had such a connection to nature and to the divine and he, leprosy didn't bother him. Mother Teresa living in the slum, looking after the poor. She was as happy as could be, you know? because they're in touch with this deeper reality. But I think it's important for each one of us to really stop and think about what is my promised land? Because we are headed somewhere in our minds, like we're telling ourselves, this is what I'm really looking for. And like, as you said, Claire, if it's somewhere in the future, well, you've just set the, you know, the present moment then is just a waste of time. Jesus, when do I get through this? When do I die? When do I get to the end of my life? You know, instead of like, wow, I could be, I could be in ecstasy right now about everything. And I can live my life as an ecstatic moment. So it's a big question. Okay, have we flogged that one to death? Thank Claire? Um, you know, you said when you asked the question, how can I be in joy during this time where people are dying of disease or, you know, the, the social unrest and things? Um, I guess because I've been thinking a lot about the Ho'oponopono and how that, that prayer um, is so effective, it's like the best thing we can do. <laughs> it's the, it's the most loving thing we can do for humanity is to find that place for, of joy for ourselves. Because the more we heal ourselves, the more we are whole, the more humanity is healed and whole. Because we're all one. And that has really been kind of, I, I think I, part of me has known that for a while, but it's been just like the lens got shifted and make it clearer for me that one of the best things I can do is to be kind to myself, to love myself, not just for myself, but for all. And I think that's kind of what, I, I was always puzzled by Matt Kahn when he do these repeat after me, I think he would do something like for myself and for all people or whatever. Um, and now it makes a lot more sense to me. It's that as I heal myself, I am lifting everyone. And so it's not selfish, it's, it's loving. Right, because you're, you're a drop of water in the ocean. And if you clean, if it's polluted and you clean your bubble, then you've contributed to the overall health and well-being of the ocean. And then the cells next to you will benefit from that. And it's like the belief is that it, since it's a spiritual energy that it does influence those around you. So uh, why don't you tell people about what you're doing? She says, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> I think about Friday morning. <laughs> oh, well, um, I'm, it's going to come out in the e bulletin on Thursday, but starting this Friday from 1030 to 11, I want to lead a Ho'oponopono prayer. And the plan is that we will do one round of Ho'oponopono for some common purpose, like, I don't know, maybe for Joy, George Floyd's family or daughter or something. And then the second round of Ho'oponopono will be for individuals. So you'll pick your own person that you want to, or, or situation or, or issue that you want to work on. So and it starts I'm at 10.30 to 11? 10.30 to 11. So it's just okay. a half hour. We aren't going to do sharing and all that kind of stuff. We're just going to jump right in and do the prayers and 
say goodbye. <laughs> so it'll be kind of short and sweet. But I think that healing, it will be focused on healing ourselves and we will heal the world. Right. Very good. Thanks for doing that, Claire. All right. So let's move on to the next segment. That was uh, great sharing. Thank you. I call upon Buddha to join me in this moment of presence. I call upon Krishna to join me in this moment of presence. I call upon Lao Tzu to join me in this moment of presence. I call upon Abraham, Moses, and Elijah to join me in this moment of presence. I call upon Muhammad to join me in this moment of presence. For in truth, there is only one God, and in presence, we are all one. I call upon all the saints and sages who have ever lived to join me in this moment of presence. I call upon the angels of God to join me in this moment of presence. I call upon Divine Mother and all the awakened women who have ever walked upon this earth to join me in this moment of presence. I call upon each and every member of this audience to join me in this moment of presence. For in truth, there is only one God and in presence, we are all one. Um. I love this particular piece of the video, and um, I've been meaning to use it some Sunday as the invocation. And I think maybe I'll use it next Sunday because I love the fact that he's calling on Buddha and Muhammad and Krishna and all of that, and then also calling on you know the presence in each one of us again to bring out that aspect of that we're all one, the presence, the presence, the presence. Anybody wanna comment on that section? That also sounds like a beautiful way to start you on the prayers. Yes, yeah. I thought that uh... It was very beautiful the way that he said that, and mm -hmm. it was like, and then they all become. Uh, we recognize that we're all one, and uh, I was thinking that I, that'd be a good way. Since I've been doing some remote uh, healings mm -hmm. over the phone, that um, that would be a great way to start. Can you hear me all right? Yep. No, oh, that would be a great way to start. Uh, uh, a session would be to call upon mm -hmm. Krishna, Buddha, and Christ, and all Abraham, and, you know, and uh, the God's angels, and on our presence. Right. And, and the emphasis on the equality of our presence. Yeah. That, that we don't, you know, oh, Krishna, Buddha, you know, Mary, yeah. like, and then, oh, me. <laughs> no. <laughs> You know that right. this is this is the same valuable presence, equal. And, and you know, Yeshua says that so many times in the way of mastery. But, you know, you you continually think that I'm better than you. That you're not as good as me. Well, 
you're the same presence. Yeah, powerful. Yeah. Um, well, what I'll what I'll do is I'll I'll extract this little piece, like I'll record it on Zoom, and then I'll use it in the Sunday service. So I'll have it. And, you know, I could always send it out if people then just want to have that clip and then you can always play it on your phone or whatever. Yeah. Okay. All right. On to the next piece. I know that many await my second coming, but how do they think I'm going to get here? Am I going to descend from the clouds on the wings of a dove? No, I've been on a long and difficult journey to get here. It is the same journey that everyone is on, and like everyone, I was lost. Lost in illusion, separate from God, and my past like a dark and terrible secret, was buried deep within me. In this lifetime, that past came flooding into my consciousness. I had to relive every terrifying moment, including my fall upon the cross. And I can tell you that was not easy. But now I've remembered who I was and who I am and why I'm here. During this lifetime, so much has been revealed to me about the nature of the mind and the existence of the ego. I have refined my teaching of the way so that now it is much more accessible. I no longer speak in parables. I want the meaning of my words to be clear and simple. Now, it might be difficult for some Christians to accept what I'm saying. Unless I look exactly like the pictures of Jesus hanging on their walls or nailed onto their wooden crosses, they will not accept me. I would have to perform miracles before they will accept a revision of my teaching and agree to take me down from the cross. I would have to change water into wine and stones into loaves of bread. And that is not going to happen. I have no interest in miracles. God does not have to prove anything. Either you respond to the truth or you don't. And you will be known by your response. So what uh, struck me about this was um, he, he talked about having to revisit, you know, everything, all the suffering and crucifixion and his fall in consciousness. And there's, um, if, you, if you know the creed or the creeds, there's a line in the creed that says, and he descended into hell. And, you know, again, people would have thought of that in the past as this place where the devil lived and it was a place of fire and it's physical and he went there and, you know, I don't know, beat up the devil or something. <laughs> but when you, when you think about um, it in terms of, in a, in a non-physical way, you think of it in terms of consciousness, what it's really saying and, and it always strikes me about this, like we, we have these things like creeds and all the rest, and they sound kind of silly at one level. And then there's a deep truth buried in there that the Christ consciousness descended into the darkest place in the human mind. And it brought the light to the darkest corners and shone the light of truth in there 
in that cave and cleansed it, changed it. And, and I, you know, I'm always, and I marvel at this, it's also in a lot of scripture that it sounds corny or it sounds silly or whatever. And then you'll, you'll come across like the real pearl of wisdom that's buried in this story in the gospel or this one line or Old Testament or whatever. And, um, and so I, I really see this as the Christ consciousness expressing itself fully, the truth of its being, and then that banishes whatever erroneous thoughts and ideas that the human mind has had about itself, and that that's the purpose of the Christ mind, is to shed light on the truth of being. And um, but that's what he's interested in. Like, he's not interested in a more primitive people who needed miracles somehow grab their attention. It's like, no, I, I'm just telling you straight now, you are the divine, you have the power of the divine in your minds, and you can create reality, that that is the power of the divine. You can express the truth of who you are. And that's all I'm interested in telling you. I'm not here to play these games anymore. It's like, here it is. If you have ears to hear, hear it. Okay, over to you guys. It reminds me, uh, Jerry, of the, it reminds me of um, how, um, the, like the definition of surrender. You know, it's letting go, you know, of, of all of that and going deep, going into your deepest, darkest uh, awareness. And mm -hmm. what? Chaos. Yeah, and uh, then surrendering to it, and it takes it away. You know? so right. It's a very, uh, it, I think we all have to do that. Mm -hmm. you know? it's, and that's the part he was talking about is how it was, wasn't easy. It was hard, you know, for him to, uh, to go there. And it's, mm -hmm. we're all afraid to go there. We're all afraid to go to where our our darkest, deepest points are in our life that we feel afraid to surrender to. But that's the only way we get there, is through facing it. And then that takes the the power. It's kind of like a temptation of Christ, you know, being you know temp tempted to uh, uh, take it seriously. <laughs> And to believe that we're not who we are. Right. Yeah, and that goes right back to the whole Pono Pono piece of, um, you know, can, can I look at my experience and not project it onto someone else, not blame someone else, but say, you know, I have this anger that comes up in me and it's okay. It's, you know, and once I do that, it, it just goes away. It, it's the resistance to just being open to it is the problem, you know, I, but I surrender. It seems like also the world is uh, being asked to uh, take a collective look at, uh, you know, what, uh, what has happened. Oops, okay. You're good. Okay. No, I was just uh, thinking the, the whole world is being asked to take a collective look at their dark side, you know, when it comes to uh, uh, inequality and uh, all the systemic racism and uh, inequality of all types of things that, um, you know, and I know a lot of people say, well, you know, we didn't do that. It's not us, but it really is um, taking responsibility for for just the earth, you know, the, the, uh, the consciousness of the earth that we can, I think uh, the whole Ho'oponopono idea is, um, is really wonderful to do that. We can, we don't have to say, well, I did this specifically, but maybe we've had some um, lingering thoughts of something, everyone has had that, but the, the overt things we can still, we can still put love upon it you know, to help heal it. Yeah, and again, if, if there is only one presence here, one being, 
then in truth, we have done all these things. The unconscious part of who we are is the policeman and is the slave owner and all of these horrendous things that you know, are in Irish history and any history, you know, German history, we go around the world and we all have those stories. And of course, the collective is only reflecting the individual consciousness and the individual consciousness is reflecting the collective. So, yeah, I mean, all of this is coming up so profoundly now. And how is it going to be solved? It's going to be solved on an individual basis. And, you know, the new sort of slogan is to say, I'm racist and I want to be anti-racist. That it's not, it's not enough to say, well, I'm not a racist. Or, or even to say, well, yeah, I'm racist. But I'm open and I want to be anti-racist. Which is a positive energy you know i i'm not just going to be um not against gays but i'm going to do something positive to promote the lives of gay people and be open and include them in my circle of friends you know and that's a huge difference because like to say well i'm not racist probably there's a little bit of denial there um an unwillingness to see how you might be. But then to say, well, I want to be anti-racist means I'm going to look at the ways that I need to think about things differently and open up to other experiences. And what can I do that's positive? Can we think of a word besides anti-racism? No. <laughs> <laughs> you, know. you know how and the abortion and the abortion uh, issue, instead of um, this pro-life instead of anti-abortion, um, and pro-choice instead of anti-abolition of abortion, I guess. Um, pro-equality, pro-equal. Pro right. I mean, I think just because the anti says a, something of resistance and against, and I want to be for equality and for, you know, I want. I want to see justice and equal treatment. You know, a, a memory is coming up for me that, um, I don't know, this may not have any relevance, but I was a little girl at a slumber party and we were playing beauty pageant. Okay. Beauty <laughs> pageants, oh. Beauty pageant. And you know how in beauty pageants they ask the contestant a question? <laughs> what and you want? <laughs> I think the question that was posed to me was something like, what's your perfect world? And I began talking about everybody being treated equal and everybody having what they needed. And, and it was a very innocent, beautiful way of seeing the world. And someone said to me, don't you know that's communism? <laughs> <laughs> and I became instantly ashamed and embarrassed because yeah. I had been spouting communist propaganda and I didn't know it. <laughs> I don't know why that memory came up, but it just did. Maybe it needs to be healed. <laughs> it came up to be healed. To let your embarrassment out and your innocence <laughs> restored. Beautiful. I have something. Kathy. Thank you for that, Claire. That that was really funny. <laughs> I enjoyed it. But anyway, um yes, so so I am racist and being anti-racist used to mean, oh, I know, I'll just be nicer. And to be even more anti-racist, I would just work at being even more nicer. And unfortunately, you know, as I grew up, I began to learn that being nice is a good thing, but it is not the solution to systemic racism. And every day I know that I benefit from systemic racism. And until we actually have a revolution <laughs> and change at the core and at the center, our hearts and our minds and the way we conduct our business, I don't think we're going to see equality. On the other hand, 
I know that eventually the world will be what it's supposed to be. Kathy Lee, there's a wonderful quote by the Dalai Lama, and I can't say it verbatim, but it's basically, you know, we've tried social revolutions, we've tried economic revolutions, they don't work. We need a spiritual revolution. And and that's really what we're about right now. And, and with the whole Pono and with all the unity teachings, it's about transforming from within. And as we recognize who we are, then it's not about being nicer, but it's being more present. And when you're present, it, then love comes through. I am so grateful every day that I get to be part of unity because I really believe that we are sharing the light of love and that we do want to see the blossoming of all the love possible that we can see in the whole world. I really think that. Thank you. Yeah. You know, for me, um, when I was thinking about uh, prejudice and uh, inequality and everything, we, you know, and it hasn't, uh, you know, I was probably, I believe in, uh, in reincarnation, or at least that we're in touch with all our, uh, everyone that's ever lived. You know, if we're all one, we've been all one since the beginning. So I was both the English, because uh, I'm about half English and half Irish. So there's a nice combination of uh, people being, I mean, they made, they, the English treated the Irish like, just terrible. They enslaved them. They starved them. They did all kinds of terrible things. So I've got, I can see how in the big picture that we've all been racist and we've all been uh, victims of racism. And so I, uh, for me, that's easier to relate to maybe than uh, the black and white issue or the, you know, it's that we've all been, uh, we're all guilty of being slave owners and slaves uh, are not guilty of it, but we've all experienced yeah. it. And so uh, uh, when, until we realize that and uh, uh, really truly accept that we've been a part of it, we've played a part in that forever, that uh, that's how we can heal it, you know, is by realizing it and taking on responsibility for it. And Richard, I know you wanted to get in there, but I just want to make a quick comment. This came up last night in the way of mastery when we got into a whole thing about victimization. And the passage was saying that you can never be a victim because God is not a victim. And God only creates like itself. And that to say that I'm a victim is to say that I've been created unlike God. And I realize, again, these are pretty deep teachings, but it's true. It's like the reality of who I really am is I cannot be a victim. And, okay, you don't go saying that to people, you know, who are <laughs> on the ground and a policeman is beating the crap out of them or has his knee on their neck. But the reality is that their spirit is eternal, infinite in this moment when this is happening. And that we've all got to start seeing the deeper picture of things by going into this place of quiet and silence and witnessing what's happening from that deeper place. And um, Richard. I was just going to tag on to what Claire and Kathy Lee were saying that it, the last several weeks I've been, as I watch the news, I just coming back to what I realized when I shifted from being a political activist to a spiritual activist, and the, uh, just that, uh, like you all said, it, it, we're not going to have this revolution that we're trying to have right now unless we do it at the spiritual level. So I don't believe we're going to succeed if it's just political because it will, all that ever does is creates the pendulum swing that goes back and forth and back and forth and or or does the thing where we uh particularly in america where we pay attention to one thing and then shift you know just just like with the attention shift away from COVID, even though it's still happening right um 
to to shift to the inequality racism stuff and um i am encouraged how well this is being sustained so i'm hoping that there is more of a there, there's something there's some energy that is more sustainable this time but I still don't trust that that's going to be enough unless we take this to the spiritual level. So I'm looking for signs in the news and other people who, you know, have a, have a bully pulpit, have a, have a voice and to shift things and stuff to all the looking for, you know, that coming up and I'm seeing little glimpses of it. Uh, but I am just hoping and praying that it becomes the message with this whole transformation, that that this is a time that America and the whole world wakes up to the spiritual transformation, the the state of consciousness we're in is the only way to get to this kind of promised land. You know, if you're thinking of the promised land in terms of politically, of, of equality for all, everybody treated the same, we ain't gonna get there unless it's done on a spiritual level. I had the same, thoughts back in the 80s when it was environmental movement that was my focus you know it just it, until we as a species shift to this idea that there's not man and nature that we are nature we are not going to sustain any of the environmental causes that you know were up back then and i i think it's the same thing now well, you know, I think part of what's um, sustaining it is that we're in the middle of an election cycle. I, I think that the fact that there's a presidential election in November is what is giving it sort of a, a road forward. And then with, you know, beyond that, hopefully. <laughs> but the thing, the thing that is so important about it being a spiritual thing is that you can you can create any document you want which we have we have all the documentation all men are created equal and as they're writing it blacks weren't included there you know you can never base this on human conditions alone the only condition that is irrefutable is that you are the divine presence. You are a loved child of God. That has to be the basis for equality, or there will always be some reason to say, yeah, but in your case, no. And I can get off the hook here and I don't have to treat you as equal. The only way I can't do that is when I say, we are all one presence, one being, and we are a spiritual being, the divine period. And that's why it has to be a spiritual revolution. And, you know, we've tried to disseminate that into political movements and you know, the French Revolution or whatever else. And it, it loses its momentum because it gets off base of that founding principle, spiritual principle of who we are. And that's why it's so important that we have the practice of practicing the presence of who we are. That's the spiritual revolution. And it's not because people are black that they need to be treated equal. We're not treating them equal because of the color of their skin. That's not gonna work. We're treating them equal because they are me. They are the divine. Great discussion. We've. Uh, used up our allotted time. So thank you all for being here. And thanks for sharing. And uh, um, this Les is Leslie. I just uh, say that again, Leslie. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I just uh, during the class got a call from Carolyn Homan. And um, she wanted to share that she's home. Her procedure went really well, and she feels great. And she is sure it's because of all the prayer. Okay, thanks for sharing that. Who was that a message from? Carolyn Homan. 
she, she had a, a procedure yesterday. So, all right. all right. Love you all. Thank you for being on the conversation. And this has been recorded, so it will go online on YouTube. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.